So today's going to be an introduction to the Soldat Hormonal Symphony and basically how do you connect the dots between what patients come in saying, in other words their chief complaint, their symptoms, their history of present illness, to what you find on physical exam, to then what treatment plan are you going to develop and how do you implement that on the first visit. So our objectives are really to try and learn and, uh, or gain an understanding of what's going on with the history and physical or, and trying to assess the hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, gonadal axis and how those hormones are processed because remember part of the hormonal symphony is also estrogen metabolism, right? So we're going to look at what's going on in their um, communication system among all the different hormones. What's going on with insulin? What's going on with the adrenals? What's the thyroid up to? The sex hormones. And then how are they metabolizing these? What's the estrogen metabolism? Because that gives us a window not only to looking at risk, but also at what is going on with the detoxification pathways in that particular patient. So I really want you to try and use your physical exam skills to gain an understanding of what's going on in the hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, gonadal axis, as well as what balance or what needs to be balanced, what this equilibrium exists, and what can you do about it. Because what disrupts hormonal balance? Many different things, right? It can be their lifestyle, it can be their genetics, it can be toxins that they've been exposed to, chronic stress, infections, you name it. So we we're gonna try and put all this together to try and identify what has happened to them thus far. So we're connecting the dots between their symptoms, what you find on physical exam, to then come to a understanding of what the dysfunctions are. Now we know that with functional medicine, we often talk about our ATMs, antecedents, triggers, and mediators. So really what we're gonna to try to figure out is what were those triggers that are affecting their history, their um, genetics, but also what they've done thus far, because antecedents are not just genetics. Antecedents are your predisposing factors. It could be diet, right? A can be a habit, like smoking, for example. And then it's the interaction between the triggers, which triggers can be infections, it can be food sensitivities, it can be nutrient deficiencies, it can be a hormone imbalance in another area that then is affecting a separate hormone. And remember that when we think about infections, we have to look at the whole spectrum, whether it's fungal, bacterial, parasitic, viral, and we need to consider all of them. And even hidden infections, like endodontal infections, or also reactivated ones as well, with particularly, um, or with particular emphasis on uh, viruses because that will send out these mediators that can then cause an imbalance and disease and hopefully we can identify them early enough before it becomes a disease when it's an imbalance. Now anytime you think of a hormonal imbalance I want you to start thinking of how did this person develop it and I want you to consider at the top of the list food allergies, food sensitivities, reactions to what we are ingesting, dysbiosis, change in the gut microbiota, leaky gut, for example. But also, what was added to our food? What are some of the additives or accesses that may be there? But also consider digestive insufficiencies, problems in not just stomach acid, pancreatic function, but also in the biliary tree. And then we want to consider oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. But in many cases, we may need to look a little further when we think of mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress because there may be another underlying cause. So you have to sort of connect the dots between what the patient has complained about, what you've obtained with your history, as well as what you find on physical exam. But then we want to consider toxins. Uh, but the fact that maybe obesity in this particular patient is a main trigger. But consider stress, adrenal dysfunction, but basically what stress their life in general has brought to them. In other words, what has happened to them thus far? Because stress may not just be what's happened to them now, 
It can be what's happened to them to this point, but it can also be an early childhood experience, an early childhood trauma, and we know that that can contribute or cause you to be on this heightened sort of awareness or this um, instant and continuous state of um, adrenal dysfunction or of um, so your HPA axis hyperawareness or dysfunction. But also consider some of your lifestyle factors like sleep and lack thereof. So lack of sleep could be a major one. Deficiencies or nutrient accesses, but don't forget about prescription drugs and particularly prescription drugs that they've been on previously and may not be on currently, such as statins, for example, and the risk of diabetes and insulin resistance. But you can consider other drugs like your PPIs, your proton pump inhibitors, and the fact that it predisposes someone to have a low stomach acid and the inability to then process their food and therefore absorb it. And you want to consider your genetic predispositions too, but consider the fact that they may have more than one cause. So where do you start with all history? A very comprehensive history. You're going to ask what has happened to them thus far, all the way from childhood, and if you can even obtain a prenatal history, it is of utmost importance. What was their mother under, uh, or what stressors was she under while she was carrying him or her? And then you wanna also look at all the things we learn in medical school, right? You're gonna look at chief complaint, history of present illness, past medical history, uh, dietary history, but you're gonna be a lot more specific and you're gonna ask a lot more questions and you're going to be a lot more detailed, right? Detail-oriented. So. You're also going to ask about supplements, not just what they're on now, but what they were on before, their lifestyle, their social history, and their exercise history. And then you're going to do a very thorough head-to-toe physical exam, and you're going to decide on what laboratory evaluations you're going to obtain, but you're going to start your, your treatment as of that day based on your subjective history as well as your physical exam. Now, when we talk about obtaining a, a history I mentioned that you want to ask what happened to the mother while they were carrying the patient, right? But we also want to ask what was the birth like? Was it a vaginal birth? Was it a C-section? Was she or he breastfed? And were they exposed to a lot of antibiotics or hospitalizations early on? You want to get an idea of what's going on with the gut microbiota. And of course, you're also going to ask, is there a history of digestion dysfunction? or gut problems? Is there gastroesophageal reflux? Is there a lot of flatulence? Is there abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea? But in addition, you want a history of their B, or you want to get an idea of what is their B vitamin status or what are they at risk for based on B vitamin function and status. So you're going to ask, is there cancer in the family? Are there a lot of vasculopathies? Uh, is there dementia or uh, neurodegenerative disorders? And then you're going to take all this information and you're going to do a very thorough physical exam. Well, there's certain things that I've used along the years that I'm hoping uh, that you'll find useful. And number one is just body shape by itself. You can look and see, are they an apple or are they a gynoid if it's a woman? And if it's a man, um, what is their structure like? Do they have good muscle mass? Same thing with a woman. With muscle mass, you look in both. Body shape's a little harder with men, so we tend to use it more in women. But you can also see, is there a belly? In a woman, that would be sign of hypercarzolemia. In men, same thing. But it can also be dietary indiscretion. So you want to start looking at that. Look at their skin. What's the color of the skin like? And uh, do they have that um, kind of orange, brownish hue that you would see with elevated ACTH levels, for example, particularly if they've been elevated for a while? And then you want to look at uh, one thing I forgot to mention with respect to body shape is are they gynoid, are they android, but are they an extreme gynoid? So let's just take a look at a few of those. In the beginning you can just say is it an apple, is it a pear? Because we used to think that an, a pear was cardioprotective and now we know, well, but there's other things that come up with respect to the risks um, in a woman who's more like a pear. If they're more like an apple, so an android, you consider things like um, elevated epicytokines, insulin resistance, and um, more of lower adiponectin levels. But remember that body shape takes you so far, but you can have someone that has a totally normal body shape 
and still be your, they can be the thin fat person. Nice to be one of those. So that means that on the outside they may be very thin, have a normal body shape, but yet they may have increased visceral adiposity. So some people will have it and look more like a apple and others may also have it and be a pear and be normal weight. So you wanna look at that and this is why body composition analysis is so important and I use bioimpedance. Uh, but you can use whatever you uh, see fit or whatever your uh, budget allows. Bioimpedance is inexpensive and it's a pretty good approximation as with as what you would get were you doing a, a body scan, so a, um, a DEXA for example. So the high cortisol then is going to be the woman who uh, comes in and says, Doc, I never had a belly all my life. I've been very flat and all of a sudden I feel like I'm wearing a tire. That's a sign of elevated cortisol level. But the high adrenaline person can be the person that even though they're exercising a lot, they don't have a lot of muscle mass. So you look at them and they look a little bit emaciated even though they're working out quite a bit. Your gynoid person has risks uh, more of hypothalamic pituitary, adrenal, gonadal dysfunction, but they can also have increased detoxification abnormalities as well as your uh, call what's called infecto obesity uh, risks and they tend to have more gastrointestinal concerns and more food sensitivities and food allergies. With respect to the gynoid, you want to look at the extreme gynoid. This would be your estrogen dominant person. The person who, even if their um, levels look normal, like let's say their estradiol levels on a laboratory exam, if they're an extreme gynoid, they're estrogen dominant and you need to figure out why. Could they be in or hepatically recirculating their hormones? Um, are they higher on estrone, for example? Um, and or are they also having more of a um, semi-conjugated estrone, for example, that could be. So they could have more of the 4-hydroxyestrone or the 16-hydroxyestrone and be estrogen dominant. Now, remember that someone can be estrogen dominant because they're insulin resistant, because insulin resistance will lead to increased insulin secretion, which will act on the hepatocytes to decrease your sex hormone binding globulin. But at the same time, it upregulates 1720 lyase, and so the total end result is that you end up with higher levels of testosterone. Testosterone preferentially binds to sex hormone binding globulin, right, irreversibly, but because you have less sex hormone binding globulin, you end up with more increased free estrogen. So insulin resistance can lead to estrogen dominance. And of course, if someone's estrogen dominant, you want to make sure you're looking at estrogen metabolism, but really we want to look at that with everyone and realize that there are single nucleotide polymorphisms in that area, which we will discuss on the fifth module um, when we're talking about estrogen metabolism. Now let's take a step back and look at what other signs can you look for on physical exam. So I'm particularly talking about what do you see in the uh, skin and the oral mucosa. Let's just thank my good friend Dr. Michael Stone for the next few slides which he developed and he's amazing uh, in general but particularly amazing at physical exam skills and trying to figure out what's the underlying pathology, what's the underlying dysfunction. So he focuses a lot on the mouth uh, but he also says that we should have eyes to see and expectations to find and I think that's really brilliant. So in addition to looking at the mouth um, you want to look at the skin, so mucosa, the mouth for example, but also what's going on with the skin, the hair, the nails, remember that your nails tell a story, and you can also do senses and nerve function, which I tend to do when someone has more of a neurological complaint, but I don't necessarily do it on everyone, just for the, uh, for the sake of time. When you look in the mouth you, and you look at the mucosa, you get an idea about their B vitamin status, and there's a lot of different B vitamins, and there's a lot of different findings you can have. So I can't remember everything, so I memorize a few, and then the rest you can just look uh, at the slide that I have there, you can laminate it, or you can make your own list. So the, what I remember is, for example, that papillary um, atrophy is consistent with riboflavin deficiency. GALT is gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So if you have a enhanced lambda fissure or an enhanced longitudinal fissure, lambda being, if you're looking at your tongue, the one that goes from the back of your mouth to the uh, front of your mouth, that is your um, longitudinal fissure. The ones that run 
um, opposite that, so like from ear to ear, that is your lambda fissure. So if they're enhanced, or in other words, if you can see them a lot more, they're sort of uh, stand out more, then you know that they have gut associated lymphoid tissue that's inflamed. Now, uh, there's many other signs that you look for on the tongue and on the mucosa, and they're listed there for you. The skin, you want to um, look at, and you want to look at texture, temperature, color, hydration, but also look at hair distribution, but look at what is happening on the skin. For example, if you have those bumps, if you will, right, uh, those small nodules on the back of their arm, or what's called hyperkeratosis, hyperkeratosis pilari, think of your low omega-3 status. Uh, the other thing is you can look around the neck, and if you see acanthosis nigricans, which is the darkened area around the neck, that is very, very highly associated with insulin resistance. Particularly in the, in the Latino population, there is a 90 over 90% correlation with acanthosis nigricans and insulin resistance. But it's not just around the neck, you can see it in the axilla, in the uh, elbows, in the inguinal area, anywhere that there's sort of intertiginous tissue where you can see it. So the axilla in particular, you can look there too. Now on the nails, the nails tell a story. So let's say that you see enhanced longitudinal ridges that's associated with low HCL. In the literature, there's a little bit of information about it and low B vitamin, uh, particularly B6. But I always see, if I see enhanced um, longitudinal um, lines, to me that's low HCL, but then I have to figure out why. Because if you have low HCL, you're not able to break down your proteins um, and your uh, food very well, and so you, you're going to have less of keratin available for the nails as well. Now, the other thing is, what if you see spots? If you see white spots on the nail, that's associated with low zinc. But you want to look at the ridges, but also what's the nail like? Is it soft? Is it chipping? You know, what's going on in the, in the sense of its texture? Now, let's look at a summary of what you would find on a physical exam. So we're gonna look at acanthosis nigricans. It gives us an idea about insulin resistance. White spots is associated on the nails, is associated with low zinc. Hyperkeratosis pylori is omega-3 deficiency. Um, a couple other things that you can look at in the tongue, so remember the enhanced fissuring is an upregulated gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Taste bud atrophy, low B2 riboflavin, but it can also be low iron, low niacin, and a low uh, B12, but there's a little bit more information with riboflavin. And in particular, riboflavin is such an important B vitamin. Not that the other ones are not, but it's one that we often forget about that's extremely important. And then uh, remember if they have a new onset abdominal girth, you're gonna think about the cortisol steel. Really what we're talking about is a diversion of cortisol or because what's happened is that the precursors along the steroidogenic pathway, particularly progesterone, has been diverted to the glucocorticoids and away from the mineral corticoids and the sex hormones. So how are we gonna put all this together? and have a plan or decide how we're going to approach our patient. That's where the Saudade Hormonal Symphony comes in, where we're gonna be looking at insulin, the adrenals, the thyroid, the sex hormones, and the estrogen metabolism, but in estrogen metabolism, we're also getting an idea about detoxification. So let's just start with insulin, and there is a method to my madness. We start with insulin because insulin is a major hormone and it has so many downstream effects. So I, I know that you're gonna have patients that are gonna have problems with insulin, problems in the adrenals, problems in thyroid, uh, problems with estrogen metabolism. They may have imbalances in estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and you're gonna look at all those. But the order in which you start is extremely important, and you wanna start with insulin first. It may be that in someone's case, you may be doing more than one at a time. So you may be doing insulin and adrenals and thyroid, but you really want to consider the order and if you haven't ordered labs yet and you're gonna start this protocol on the very first visit, start with insulin. Extremely important. Let's go on to adrenals. So we don't often think about this, but the endocrine system is located throughout the body, right? And although we're focusing on one area of the endocrine system, the adrenals, remember that, that they communicate with multiple other areas like 
the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pancreas, right? These are all parts of the endocrine system. We're just focusing on the adrenals. So let's move on to thyroid. Our next stop, so to speak, in the Sodat Hormonal Symphony. Let's just take an overall look, because um, to me, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we know that the hypothalamus releases TRH. TRH acts on the pituitary to release TSH. TSH then works on the thyroid to make T4. A little bit of T3, as I said, but only 5%. 95% um, of what's made in the thyroid is T4. T4 then goes to the kidney and the liver, and it gets converted to the active hormone T3. And remember we said that that is a selenium a dependent enzyme, that deiodinase, so extremely important. Let's move on to the next section of the Sodat Hormonal Symphony, which are the sex hormones. Now, when we're talking about the sex hormones, we're gonna be talking about estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And let's look at what happens in the normal menstrual cycle. Because in the normal menstrual cycle, you have two phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So in the follicular phase, FSH increases, right? And then you have your, um, and estrogen is low as FSH increases and estrogen increases. And then in the luteal phase, you have your elevated progesterone, particularly when the egg pops out of the ovary and the corpus luteum then makes your uh, progesterone. So if you remember, if you have an anovulatory cycle, you're not going to have the elevated levels of progesterone, which is what we often see in the perimenopause. So that for now is the sex hormones. I really hope you join me for the lecture or the module on sex hormones where we'll go into a lot more detail on all these different topics that I just barely touched on. And we'll be covering the studies a lot more. Let's move on to the last module or the last circle in the cell hormonal symphony, which is estrogen metabolism. So what are we talking about when we talk about estrogen metabolism? We're really talking about sort of that end area of the steroidogenic pathway, right? It's how estradiol, estrone, then gets converted or further metabolized. So think of what happens to our hormones. And realize that you can have genetic polymorphisms that will affect how those get broken down. And I'm gonna review the three major pathways and where we can have single nucleotide polymorphism. So I'll review the genetics or the genomics, but we're going to also have to deal with other things in the environment that can affect how we metabolize our estrogens that haven't really been touched on. And we'll touch a lot more on this because I feel this is a key area. This is an area that we can have so much influence over both women and men's lives. Because looking at estrogen metabolism, whether you're a man or you're a woman, is really a window into the risk. And I'm talking about the risk to cancer, right? To a especially hormone-related cancer, more if you're talking about women, but in men we know that how they metabolize their estrogens uh, or their hormones in general, but their estrogen particularly, is related to their risk for lymphoma. Not so much literature on women with, with respect to lymphoma, but it's it's emerging, it's a, a, a growing field. Here's my Saudade Hormonal Symphony. Start out with insulin, address adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones, and estrogen metabolism. Because if we're going to do hormone rebalancing, right, or bioidentical hormone replacement, we have to look at estrogen metabolism. But my true belief is that we should be looking at estrogen metabolism in every man or woman that comes through our office because that's a way that you can estimate the risk and also look at what's going on with their detoxification pathways because we all unfortunately live in a very toxic world. So my best of luck to you and I'll see you in the next module.